such a moment tells us that innate to our condition, who or whatever we are, there is something that's profoundly peaceful, not mental, absolutely absent the sensation of time. Awareness, the final frontier. These are the explorations of Jonathan Robinson and Brian Tom O'Connor. Their continuing mission, to discover fresh new paths to the mystery within, to seek out new joys and new methods of awakening, to boldly go into the heart of expanded consciousness. This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome, fellow explorers. It's good to have you back. Of course, I'm Jonathan Robinson, and I am with my trusty co-host, Brian Tom O'Connor. And today we will be exploring a little bit about what awakening is like, both before and after. And we're very honored to have someone who has written a lot about that subject and speaks from personal experience. Perhaps you know her. Her name is Jan Frazier. Brian and I are a very big fan of her books, which include When Fear Falls Away, The Freedom of Being, Opening the Door, and The Great Sweetening. And I, you know, I've read a lot of people's books, but Jan's books are different in that they really go into depth about her personal experience, both before and after a awakening. And I find that absolutely fascinating, and we are very honored to have you on the show, Jan. Welcome to Awareness Explorers. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. So, uh, as I mentioned right before the podcast, that uh, both Brian and I have been listening to your books, reading your books, and feel like we have been like immersed, in a way, in a little bit of what it's like to go from our average neurotic selves to a totally new experience of life. And I guess the first curiosity I have is when you think back to your pre-awakened life and, and how you live now, what strikes you as one or two of the biggest differences? Like, God forbid, if you had to go back to that experience, what would you notice? Like, oh my God, this is you know, really different. Uh, the two things that come to me are the conspicuous absence of torment mm -hmm. and, and maybe this is another way of saying the same thing, but not being in my head <laughs> uh -huh. and, and also that the, this is a third way of saying the same thing really, but the present moment, whatever it consists of, feels like the only thing that's real. So I feel really here, as opposed to being in my head, which means not really here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say, well, I guess there's a lot less thoughts also. Yeah, I do think. Mm -hmm. But I think deliberately not mm. as a default. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean as a tool that you can use in everyday life as opposed to uh, your way of experiencing life in general, in, in total? Yeah. Like there isn't an automatic need to interpret everything. But the mind is a wonderful tool when, <laughs> when it's not being used to hit ourselves with a blunt object. <laughs> right. Yeah, I always think of it as um, as real reality and, and virtual reality. The virtual reality is this the story about the past and the future and how things should be and how things might be that goes on. And real reality is what's happening now, what we're what we're experiencing through our our perceptions, through our body, and and just the mm -hmm. present moment, which is really the only thing. Yeah. It's a very animal experience, really being here. Mm. And, and what you're calling virtual reality, which is an apt way of saying it, uh, like 
like the virtual reality devices that we sometimes now use convinces us of its it it's able to trick us into thinking that it is reality yeah. hence its power and so it's at a, anything mental is at a remove from life itself but the trouble is we don't typically realize that and so we equate it with life and then we're living at a distance from life always i found it interesting well something i found unique about some of your books is that you usually don't have awakened people talk so directly about their day-to-day -day experience and i found that really helpful because as i was reading about you know maybe what your experience is during the day or during challenging situations it seemed so simple and made my virtual reality day seem really bizarre you know where normally it doesn't seem bizarre because i live in it but with enough descriptions of this other world which is always here and is missed by thoughts and you know concepts um it helped me to kind of settle into a quieting and i really appreciate that because very few people have written a book like when fear falls away which is almost like a diary of your before and after experience and um i just found that like a a new form of of awakening literature it's almost like a unique class uh is that something that just seemed obvious to you to to present yourself in that way or was it part of your writing background i didn't write any of that with any intent mm -hmm. in fact a lot of the writing happened before i had any idea what it was had happened wow i had no understanding of it so i was just writing it i guess because i was used to writing i was just writing a description of what it was like whatever it was uh huh but you know what the point of it all to me of this whole huge exploration that we're looking at and the point of life is that we are embodied we are human beings we're animals we're mortal we we get sick we age we have people in our lives we we deal with real life issues that come along and the question is and this is a thrilling proposition to me and it gets more thrilling all the time what is it what does it mean to live an embodied down to earth day to day human existence without being attached without getting in the head without having all the mental mess keep us at the distance from the larger truth which is not embodied you know what some people would call divinity or spaciousness or here we go with the uselessness of words but mm -hmm. so th to me that this is the incarnation you know it's like what what is it what does it feel like to live a day-to-day moment-to-moment existence that's fully human without identifying with that as being all we are and uh and i i realize that not everybody perceives it this way or experiences it this way mm -hmm. i happen to be very physical love being physical i love being in motion i love the senses i enjoy good food and all that and enjoy being with people that are special to me and so i think we we we're so used to associating life with suffering naturally because historically it has been that it's a natural thing for some people to think well if i wake up i'm somehow not going to be able to function or i'm going to be necessarily at a remove from the knit and grit of daily existence because we're used to associating all that stuff with the, the causers of pain mhm mm but when we tease apart the pain we've inflicted on ourselves with this from the the very natural human pain that comes along with any human existence like grief over the death of a loved one you know loss when we're able to tease that apart then we get to be thrillingly alive mm. 
So, you know, and I hadn't thought any of that through when I wrote that book. I mean, these are discoveries I've made over a lot of years by now. Yeah. I have, uh, I had a friend, I was talking to a friend recently, and, and he was talking about a couple of different awakening experiences that he had. And what you just said reminded me of it, because in the first one, he felt it was all about emptiness. And everything just seemed totally empty to him. And the second one was more about everythingness, although that wasn't really the word he used. But the two experiences, one in which existence was empty and another in which it was entirely full, it was full of everything. It seems to me that the second one might be more conducive to living day-to-day -day life as you talked about it. Do you think those two can be reconciled or are they the same thing in different stages? I, I get I get what you're looking at here. One one way I might have of orienting to everythingness is that and this this I detected very early on even though I had no idea what I was detecting is the incommonness of all existence. So even the manifest, you know, the daily kind of stuff that you you were just describing, it all has something in common. There's something felt, what what some would call consciousness, or you know, something. But then, but then, I don't know if I'm directly addressing what you were getting at, but it's just what comes to me right now. That the emptiness, to me, the emptiness and the everythingness are kindred or or, or we could say one has to do with space itself and the other has to do with form. But I perceive all, all form as having something in common. So everythingness to me can conjure that or, or it can conjure the varieties of form, abundance and all of that. I do think that people have different um, kinds of experience. And I certainly, I, you know, I could try to describe spaciousness itself where where I'm not even aware of being here or being a somebody or any of that. It doesn't have any content in it. Uh, and certainly, I you know, what could be possibly sweeter? And yet, in order to drive a car <laughs> or to remember one's name or to, or to even recognize a sound as indicating a person, it becomes necessary, and we can easily do this swiftly, to come back into somebodyness, you know, to register. There's such a thing as taking care with the wheel of a car in your hands. You know, mm -hmm. so to, to me, a human being is equipped to do either. Not everybody experiences them both, though, for sure. And I have, I have learned that from listening to others. Some people will will describe them and these are not people that can that would describe themselves as spiritual or anything or seekers at all but they'll describe a moment when they were doing something radically uh, physical like fishing holding a fish pole and and the utter stillness they were absolutely tuned into the sensation of a pull on the line and they suddenly realize that their minds have gone completely quiet I mean, there are there's endless examples of this where somebody will say they remember that moment forever because of how profoundly still and peaceful they felt. No sense of themselves. It's because they were focusing so purely on a physical task. So there's all kinds of ways people who would never call themselves awake or, you know, aspire to it will recollect a moment of profound stillness and peace. And sometimes it's in a terrible crisis. Mm. <laughs> But it does tell us that there's something to us. When a person has a moment like that and they've never forgotten it, and I've heard the most moving accounts from people describing it, such a moment tells us that innate to our condition, who or whatever we are, there is something that's profoundly peaceful, not mental, absolutely absent the sensation of time 
and it's already there. <laughs> so how come, it, how come we're not always in that or aware of that? You know, that's the compelling question that we're all asking, I suppose. Right. Well, let's ask that question. You know, uh, you get to probably interact with a certain amount of seekers. What uh, is a common error that you see seekers making? Well, once somebody's been at it a while, like once, let's say, it's really registered deeply in a person that there's more going on in them, in life, than the trouble causer. And then there's, a, there's an earnest, heartfelt longing to find their way to that or more of the time or something. What I, I think what people often neglect to do is to question the authenticity, the reliability of the awareness in them, uh, the, I, I don't know what to call it, but the part of themselves that's trying, say, to, to drop thought or trying to uh, inquire into, you know, what's happening in the moment, or thinking they know what is asked for, thinking that they can know, oh, now I've really gotten somewhere. Now I've made some progress. They fail to question the one that's doing that movement, that seeking, that imagining it understands. Uh, and of course, <laughs> As it appears to me, those very earnest attempts to say meditate, to sit to quiet the mind, or you know whatever, or to look for a certain ease, or to, uh, the one doing that is really just a refined version of the troublemaker that perceives mm -hmm. difficulty, that perceives imperfection, and and so it's such a rich experience when a person comes to suddenly, and I want to describe this in spatial terms because that's how I tend to picture it, but people picture it in different ways or they don't picture it at all. I just sense it. But there's something in us that's at a distance from, bigger than, more spacious than, the little creature that I was just struggling to describe. That can, it's the space in which it's all happening. So if I'm, if I'm, sitting for meditation or just in a moment of, of awareness and I've just become aware that I'm that I've been lost in thought or that I have an identity I've just recognized an identity I didn't realize was there before and then I want to do something about it. if I become aware of the desire to do something about it or even even that I'm ha I'm doing something in me is saying that's in the way of awakening and wherever I am now, and then sets out with any momentum, any kind of effort, any kind of imagining that it would know what to do about that. Mm -hmm. there, if, it's, if something causes that whole thing to just pause and back up or up or whatever, soften, we completely relax all effort, simply allow, simply see what's happening then a whole lot of wonderful fruit can be born. One of them is I will stop assuming that that thing that I've been relying on is a legitimate entity. The other, of course, is that <laughs> it stops reinforcing it. Every time we use that as if it's a valid knower of something, a valid direction seeker, Every time we use that unconsciously, we're reinforcing it as a, it be, it's a habit. And every time we see that it's working, to see that it's there, that, that it's happening, we have, in effect, allowed ourselves to step back into the bigger truth of what's containing it all. And that, mm -hmm. or that's on its way to, is the, is the longed for home. But, you know, a, a whole lot of my 
discoveries and explorations and inner wonderings and all of that for all this time since things changed has been this one humbling discovery after another that says, I mustn't ever think I know anything. So many times I thought, oh, now I get it. You know, trying to understand why people have trouble or why I had trouble, you know, the whole thing. Sometimes I'll say, oh, yeah, now I see. Or, oh, so this appears to be, in, in whatever it feels like to be me in recent times, this appears to be the way it's going to be now. <laughs> and, you know, I've, it's never stopped being in motion. So now I know better than to say, oh, now I get it. Uh-huh. So it's so, we don't know anything. We're in constant flux. Our ability to fathom anything is in constant flux. So, so the, the, the ultimate space, as if I could give words to it, is utterly at rest, absolutely without feature. It's like light in that it, it falls without discrimination on anything that's happening in it, including the idea that the idea that it's better to be absent thought than to be thinking. Yeah, it doesn't have a preference. No. Uh-huh. It's no effort. And so there's so much, and this is what breaks my heart watching a lot of people what they go through in their earnest attempts to get somewhere. There, there's such effort involved. Effort, effort, effort. Mm-hmm. And it's, I can't say it's absolutely wasted, but a lot of it is causing its own problem. Well, mm-hmm. that spaciousness that you describe and what we basically call awareness and what we explore on, on Awareness Explorers is it's already there. It's already allowing. It's not it's not something you have to do to bring to you. You just have to notice that it's always there and always reliable. And at one point in one of your books, I can't remember the exact words, uh, but you said even when you're grumpy or some emotion, I forget which one you used, awareness isn't grumpy. And awareness doesn't even care if you are. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in your case, Jan, your awakening didn't really, I mean, you were a spiritual seeker before, but um, you wouldn't necessarily say there was an effort you made. I mean, you kind of said a a soft prayer when you were going through your cancer treatment, like, hey, I, I, I hope that tomorrow isn't as terrible as it usually is, <laughs> or something like that. So I'm wondering... What makes it more likely that something like what happened to you might happen to someone else if it's not effort? A a radical mistrust of oneself. By which I mean just not taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I can't even begin to say what happened with me. I had an impression at the time and that's another thing over time I've realized more and more. I have no idea, really. Uh, I think by the time I said that prayer, and I've seen this with other people, the, the mind that might formulate a wish like I did then, the mind is the very last to get to catch up. Something in us is already ready for something, or it's already happened before we begin to articulate or recognize it or understand it. So what I think is that the very best thing for someone to do if they have this sense of of this reality that's there is uh, the very best thing they can do is to realize that they don't have any say in it and that it, it may never happen. You know, it's not like, You know, I've I've known people and I've read wonderful stories about this who who've been so simply grateful, aware and appreciative of the the blessings of momentary peace and consciousness and knowing. They've been s- simply so 
appreciative that those those times came that it wouldn't have occurred to them to want more mm-hmm. and and then some of the great stories that I've written one is in a Hindu somewhere uh, it's like that's the very person that <laughs> then you know, but you can't do that so that it will happen that way, you know. Right. It has I just, to be, it has to be real, and the wanting more is just another thing in the way. Yeah. And just to see that the one in us that wants more is, is itself an iffy unit. It, to me, doubting and questioning everything, the knowability of anything, uh, the reliability of ourselves to understand or to know is a, th- this whole thing is about an undoing and about a letting go effort. Uh, letting go thinking we know anything. And so, you know, I guess I would say if there's something somebody can do, it's to detect if I'm, if I am exerting effort, if I am judging myself, if I am resisting or trying not to resist or congratulating myself for accepting if you know any anything that can be observed that that indicates any any attempt at movement krishnamurti is wonderfully clear on this any direction wanting to go in any effort just to just to see just to gently see that that's occurring because spaciousness does not contain those things so it's all that we layer on on top of it. It's just that what we layer on is trickier to recognize mm-hmm. than many than many realize. And it's only when the whole thing stops by some miracle, good fortune, that then they get, oh, wow. And I thought I knew something or whatever. So perhaps in your case, the miracle had already happened under the surface before you asked, please take away this fear. And then that engendered the the question and it no longer became about something that's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think something like that must be the case. Mm -hmm. And yet I was completely shocked by it yeah who knows what readies us you know yeah who knows what the fertile ground looks looks like it was when you look back and or who or who knows if what we think we see is accurate yeah we think our intellect actually understands this creation and uh that is what leaves god laughing a lot of the time yeah. Yeah. yeah, and God, you know, I don't talk about God very much, even though sometimes I get asked to. But right now, I seem like I seem not to be able to help myself. The idea that God sees us, or something, whatever that is, sees us right through with all of our messes and loves us absolutely and doesn't take any of it seriously. I mean, why is that so appealing? You know, why when someone is in the presence of a beloved teacher that they sense that's going on with, Mm -hmm. why is that such a profound relief? It's because we ourselves are equipped with that same thing. We, We look for love all our lives, typically in a mate or children or whatever it is. But what we're really... We're, that's an outer expression that what we're looking for is to really know what is actually already our endowment, you could say. But it's unfathomable to the self. Mm-hmm. So if a person detects it, if they've had an experience or they sense it, or there's some longing, oh, if, if they could just celebrate that, just be grateful for it and and be willing to doubt themselves every opportunity. Oh. <laughs> when you say doubt yourself, you mean, well, what do you mean by that? Do not trust the apparent authenticity of the, the one thinking it knows what's going on with you. Mm-hmm. Life. Mm-hmm. 
Right. You mentioned, I, I think I read somewhere where you talked about two selves. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of other spiritual teachers talk about that the separate self is an illusion. And I always found that a little difficult because when I think of the separate self, I think of my body, and which doesn't seem illusory at all. But you're different. You talked about two selves, meaning the egoic self on the one hand and the, the higher self on the on the other, that the um, the higher a real self, which doesn't experience itself um, apart from from reality. So that seems more easily graspable to me. Is hmm. that a little bit what you're talking about when you talk about don't trust that? It's that sense of self in our minds. Yeah. And I'm also distinguishing between like back to the, your your observation of of our having a body. Mm -hmm. I make a distinction between the self that carries identity and belief and all that that causes the suffering on the one hand, and the particular located in space with certain life experience person that has a certain appearance, knows certain people, interacts with it. I'm distinguishing between those two. So, yes, we're, yeah. So did I, did I say what you were looking at there? Yeah, it's not, it's not the, the physical body that's really illusory or not real or it's, mm -hmm. it's that sense of self in the mind, that self definition, I think that you're, you're, that you're contrasting with the higher self or the or the the non or the the open self the one with everything yeah. self is that yeah. does that yeah. seem right yeah 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 this sometimes when people are uh uh on the path as they like to say uh they'll they'll come out with something that says oh none of this is real mm -hmm. you know uh well <laughs> right. From a certain experiential point of view, it's very real. And to dismiss it, I mean, it's a recipe for extreme denial. And, you know, I probably don't have to tell you. Spiritual bypassing. Yes, yes, that's a fine expression. Um, yeah. Real. I mean, from the point of view of vast spaciousness, nothing's real. It all comes and goes, and it doesn't care about it and all that. But we are not only vast spaciousness. We are we're going to die. Yeah. It's a grand paradox that, that we're both embodied beings and we're, un, we're, we're, we're just vast everything, not, without a center, without a definition, beings at the same time. It's a both and we and. can... We can detect both and participate in both and impossible to describe how that can be. Mm -hmm. Seems though I, that I detect sometimes a flow back and forth so that that sort of joyful, all-encompassing, um, unconditional love of, the, of, of pure universal awareness can sometimes sort of send a kind of a perfume back to the embodied self and 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 therefore we appreciate and enjoy life more yeah. do you experience anything like that something like that yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or uh, me, uh, uh, go ahead please let me uh bring up the other end of that which is how to deal with when you're when you're fully triggered you got five things you got to do a lot of how people living life especially now with the pandemic and economics and how do you suggest people deal with things like triggers or see them in a way that might be either reducing their suffering or beneficial to them in some way oh beneficial yeah well, if they start by not seeing the trigger as a problem, then the door can open. 
were indicative of a problem, but uh, it, it is an opportunity to to feel, first of all, to to allow themselves to feel what's actually happening right there uh, without necessarily te teasing it all apart, but not holding it at a, at a distance. So if they're suddenly aware of being terrifically stressed or having been offended by something somebody said or, you know, whatever, to allow the feeling of it. Um, and, you know, we often try to protect ourselves from pain. It's natural. It's a mammal thing to do. And so very often something that's a trigger carries a meaning, a significance that's larger than, beyond, you know, beyond the particular situation. So it speaks of a habitual whatever. And so underlying that is some belief, perhaps, that a person is at the mercy of other uh, people or experiences or their past. And so even, even to allow there to be space around all of that and look and see, oh, you know, feel, feel the sensation of the body and then look to see, oh, is there something here that can be seen that hasn't been seen before? And, you know, it's allowing that spaciousness to be there and just allow it all the room it needs. And then uh, very often I think... Uh, one of the, one of the one of the animating beliefs is I'm at the mercy of circumstances or or I don't you know I don't have any say in how I what I choose to do or not to do or you know any of that or, so I think we we're often our own worst enemies in that we don't we don't hold ourselves in a in a gentle sort of regard and say am I asking too much of myself here or might I might I be able to be more honest with a situation, you know, someone in a situation I'm in that triggers me, uh, might I be able to say, you know, to myself, kindness, maybe I just shouldn't get in that situation anymore. In other words, see if we can do something to make it easier for ourselves. It involves being honest with ourselves about the cost of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I, if, if I see that I'm, that I'm that things are hard, that is too much piling on. See if I if there are options. If there aren't, if there really truly aren't options, then you know the business of just doing one thing at a time can be a great blessing. Not anticipating how much more there is to do, or thinking we know that now we're, we're gonna have some spaciousness after this, or there's only three more things, and then you know, so Sometimes under in times of great stress, I think we can just say, I can only do this one thing, and, and that can really be a blessing too. And allow that gentleness with yourself rather than creating more suffering on top of everything. We don't have forever to live. We in fact we have this moment. But it is handy for the, the excellent human mind to project ahead to the pattern. So far, no human being has lived forever. <laughs> There's no reason to think I'm going to be the first. Mm -hmm. So, and is my existence precious? How, you know, how does this moment feel? And we have a lot more latitude in the matter than we are used to thinking. It's just it's something in us says, oh, but I have to, because if I didn't then, or somebody else will be upset about, you know, so to explore those things, you know, see what beliefs are there can be useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seems like one of the beliefs that we have that gets in the way when we're triggered is the belief that somehow we shouldn't be triggered. Yeah. yeah. It is useful for a person to recognize I'm being triggered. Mm -hmm. But it's often, when I hear people talk like that, it's often... It's, it's spoken of as if it's a burden that they just have to put up with or an inevitable thing that, you know, there are certain things that trigger me. Ah, I see. And, and something in us is allowing, there's a mechanism that's in motion that, that's, that we're participating in. Mm -hmm. And it is useful to see that we're being triggered because there often is something there to be seen. Something we haven't allowed ourselves to feel very often. Because mm -hmm. we're reluctant. We don't like pain. 
But if we'll, if we'll just let ourselves feel the disappointment of a thing or the, or see, you know, I'm identified with something here, it can be very opening and relieving. You mentioned before we started recording that there was a thing that you suggested that people do in, in daily life. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I'm trying to trigger your memory. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a possible other way of looking at meditation. Uh, meditation in the, in the act of living rather than uh, sitting down and being quiet and shutting mm -hmm. eyes and all that. Uh, and to me, this is, life is the great <laughs> blessed teacher if we can receive it this way. In a moment, so life happens now, now, now. That's it. That's all it's ever been. It's all already. In, in a given now, if I, for some lucky reason that I do not control, become conscious in that moment, I'm aware suddenly of being triggered or aware that I'm, in, that I'm tired, physically tired, or there's a little pain, or I'm aware of uh, being deeply immersed in the sound of another's voice as we've been doing here, or the expression on the other one's face. So it's not, it doesn't matter, good or bad, whatever it is. Suddenly become self-aware, seeing yourself experiencing something. We didn't decide to get conscious. We do not pick the now. It arrives, including whether we notice it or not. Most moments we're not conscious. But when one comes, suddenly you're just simply self-aware, that's all. Maybe what you're aware of is that you've been lost in thought. As soon as you notice awareness being there, Allow yourself to, instead of being, instead of putting attention on awareness, what awareness is of, the thought, the physical pain, or what can I do about it, or gee, I wonder why that happened. Recognize that awareness has just come into the picture, blessedly, not because you've decided to become conscious. And just allow yourself to linger in the awareness, not with any aim. You know, all it really is, is you're giving yourself the experience, you're granting yourself the experience of really being in the now and being aware that you're in the now without thinking any of these thoughts or words. So it's to, it's to discover, it's to give yourself opportunity, space to notice the many, many times in the course of every ordinary human day when you become, when awareness shows up all of its own. And a person might stop, might physically stop. We very naturally would stop often and just feel in the body or see, you know, be aware of seeing the other person's facial expression or feeling irritation, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. So it's, it's you know, we're on the receiving end always and we notice it or we don't and to me that's the whole game <laughs> but in those moments of noticing and there is a kind of appreciation or recognition oh oh what's this it's not a blissful experience it's just simply a moment of being aware and then and then if i'm if i'm noticing that i'm tense and then i and then something starts up that says oh i, sh I want to unwind or gee i shouldn't be tense or, Realize that that's not awareness, it's the mind that's kicked in. This, but the thing that can see that the mind has kicked in, that is awareness. So awareness is still there. As soon as we become conscious again, ah, there's a softening and a registering of the real, even as we're also feeling and embodied. And, ah, and I swear, because we're animals and we're built not to like pain, and awareness feels so much better than effort. Something gets reinforced. It's almost like new wiring. Or I have no idea if what I'm saying is legitimate physically, scientifically. I'd love to know. But it's almost like something begins to register. Oh, this is real. Oh, this is possible. 
And it's only right that moment. And then something happens that drops you into unconsciousness again. Okay. But then later on, you'll become aware. And then just stop and go, oh. Beautiful. What a gift for our listeners. I thank you for for sharing that. It's I think it's it's just terrific and it's the gift of life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it, it's a teacher because it helps us realize, oh, this really is innate. Yeah. It's here. It's already here. There's nothing grand about it. It's not an achievement. It's a re, you know, whatever. I don't know. It's a the mystery is why does it show up at any given moment? But but we can either recognize it or not. And to not is the sin. If we sin, that's it. Because we miss it all, all our lives. And we don't have to. I um I've written some books about uh happiness and taken a bunch of courses about happiness and was one course I took that I thought was, um, it was expensive and not very good, uh, but he said one thing that has stayed with me that made it 10 times more worth it. And that was, and it's very similar to what you just said. He said, if you find yourself enjoying a moment, you know, like you're playing with your dog or you're looking at a tree, give it some space and don't, don't, don't move on to the next thing so quickly, you know? Mm-hmm. You could double your happiness just by, instead of looking at the tree for 10 seconds, look at it for 20 seconds. And it's so simple and so prevalent, you know? So now I notice when something in my mind, you know, I'm having a great time loving my dog, just petting her and looking in her eyes. And then I have a little voice in my head that says, you really need to get to your list. And I go, you know, shut the hell up. I'm enjoying this moment, you know. And it, it's really just another one of those giving yourself space for the beauty in life, which we often jip ourselves from because something in our head takes us away. And the dog doesn't have a list. No, no. She's, she's my uh, current guru, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> trying to always give me cute looks to bring me back to the present. Yeah, Great. they're such wonderful teachers. Animal. Yeah. But the blessing there, Jonathan, is in, the, in a moment like that when you realize you're having a good time with the dog, is that you, you became conscious of, the, of how you were feeling, mm-hmm. of conscious of being in, in embodied delight, the physicality of the creature and the, your engagement. And that's lucky, lucky. And those are sacred moments. Oh, yeah. That's when we're alive. And we know we're alive. We might not be thinking those thoughts, but something in us is registering it. And if, and if we have a slew of those, even if it's not all there ever is, then when we're on our deathbeds, we're not going to have this god-awful reckoning and say, I didn't live. Mm-hmm. It's because of those moments with the dog. It's not because of the the great love we did or didn't have or the job or we just want to feel ourselves being alive, which is why the physical is so handy. We're located in space. We have sense, sense receptors and everything's in motion. And um, So we have everything that we need innate within us. There isn't something else we have to get before we can really experience that joy and reality little children it's an aid to them yeah yeah we used to be little children <laughs> what the hell happens <laughs> right, right. no but it's a it's a sign it indicates that mm-hmm. that's what we innately are yeah mm-hmm. this has been wonderful is there any last Wisdom, words, anything you want to add to what we've talked about? Actually, I would like to add something. Um, I'm not sure if this is a a question or just simply an observation, but my favorite line of yours, which is from the freedom of being, is causeless joy is universality innate. 
And it just seemed to sum up what I feel is true in my experience, but it's also so packed with meaning because it's, I mean, causeless, universal, and innate. Mm -hmm. it just seemed so profound and simple and complex at the same time. Something did just come to me because of, because of your mention of joy. It's that there's nothing that says a human life doesn't have pain. You know, so the, the willingness to allow the now to be just as it is includes heartbreak sometimes and physical pain and but but the the awareness that allows it all is itself tender and sweet and lovely and so i think it's important for people to get that by virtue of our being embodied creatures pain comes with the territory it just does it's just not this kind of pain mm -hmm. it's not this from the kind head. of pain pointing to your head for our yeah listeners on audio only oh, right. <laughs> yeah. but that is so beautiful that's just so beautifully put I thank you for as i said not many people with your uh level of awakening have talked so vulnerably about their experience and i would encourage our listeners to check out your your books because they are unique in that way i found them in a way nicely confronting confronting all the neuroses and unnecessary mental suffering i sometimes put myself through and they helped me to like see that that is really kind of a, a craziness and the simplicity of living in the now is really what is uh much more sane much more available and it's where we belong sure enough it's the only place we can be <laughs> <laughs> that's true uh people can learn more about you you have a website jan fraser teachings.com uh is there anything else you want to say about uh your book website or anything else you got going no okay no so i think that's a wrap and uh i really am honored by uh what you've shared and and thank you for putting your experience out there in a way that's so easily received oh and i appreciate what the two of you are doing what you're enabling and helping to come into our world hmm. it's a wonderful thing Together. Thank you very much. And thank yeah. you for talking to these two fanboys. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're all fans of life. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And we always end by telling our listeners and each other to keep exploring. Oh, yeah. Have a ball. <laughs> yeah, keep exploring. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. And we'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends. Because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.